Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, we'll get started with just a basic introduction while we're waiting for people to join since it's just turned 8.30. Um, but my name is Anna Maria Nievidomska and I'm one of the outreach coordinators for the BVBRC and I focus on viruses. My colleague Rebecca Watson is also here and she focuses on bacteria. So if any of you have any other questions um, that are non-viral related, you can feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, Ron Kenyon is also here from our group and will be helping uh, field any questions in the chat. Um, so the purpose of today's webinar is to kind of just help uh, Viper and IRD users reorient themselves um, to the new website since uh, you may have discovered recently that things have changed. Um, so if you're coming from Viper or IRD, this, web this webinar is to kind of help orient you to that. And if you're new to the BVBRC, we'll also be going slowly through how to access the data, what the different data types are, um, and what kind of analysis you can do um, using this website. So, let's see. So this uh, webinar is going to be recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel. We'll start out with the different data types. We're going to be using RSV as an example because uh, it's one of the viruses that we've seen a huge surge um, in infections, particularly in very young children. So we'll be using uh, RSV for our case studies. Uh, I'll then move on to introducing the different types of services and tools that you can use for analyzing uh, respiratory syncytial virus data. Uh, and then we can kind of open things up for questions and I can try and demo um, how and where to do things, how to find things for you on the website if any of you have any questions. <clears throat> So if you are not already familiar with the BRCs or the Bioinformatics Resource Centers, um, we're an NIAID sponsored uh, program where we uh, aggregate and curate data from a variety of different infectious disease pathogens, mostly focused on human pathogens in, in the case of viruses. But um, in the case of bacteria, we have pretty much uh, everything that's out there. Um, and we also do uh, a lot of outreach and respond to pandemic threats. Right now, we are uh, currently two BRCs, the BVBRC, which focuses on bacterial and viral bioinformatics. And this is a result of a merger between the Influenza Research Database and Viper, um, and Patrick, uh, the Pathosystems Resource Integration Center, which focused on bacteria. Um, VUPathDB focuses on eukaryotic pathogens, vectors, um, and fungi. So where can you find this? If you go to bv-brc.org, you'll get to our website and you can access data on bacteria, archaea, um, and viruses. And we also have uh, some information for eukaryotic hosts for analyzing things like um, RNA-seq data. So for viruses, um, obviously you're going to go ahead and click on viruses. And if you're going to IRD and Viper, <clears throat> you will be automatically redirected to the BVBRC these days. You can still find the legacy sites by clicking on IRD and Viper. Um, and you may need to because there are some tools, especially uh, from IRD, that have not been migrated yet. But we can discuss that um, in a couple of weeks in our webinar on influenza. So once you're at the site, you can click on viruses. And this will take you to a landing page that you'll recognize as being pretty similar to Viper, if you uh, are already coming from Viper. Um, <clears throat> And you'll see that we have our viral families divided uh, based on their replication methods. So, for example, the RNA viruses, single-stranded positive and negative RNA, double-stranded DNA viruses. And then on the column all the way in the right, we have our featured viruses, which are generally viruses that have been the subject of uh, recent uh, outbreaks, such as monkeypox, SARS-CoV-2. 
For RSV, you're going to want to navigate to Numo Verde. And what you can see is that the way this is organized is through a series of tabs. And the different tabs give you an idea of the different kinds of information you can find here. But uh, we'll get into that uh, more shortly. So uh, there are different ways that users can view the data, and that's through clicking on these different icons. Um, and these will take you to a different landing page um, that gives you a specific view. So for example, the taxon view will allow you to see all of the genomes um, within a selected taxonomic level. So let's say you click on the new Moverde family, you can see everything uh, like the genera, subgenera, species, and everything below the subspecies level as well. The genome view, uh, on the other hand, lets you look at a single annotated genome so that you can see any information relating to that, how many proteins it has, um, how long it is, any other features that might be there. Uh, the genome group view is similar to the genome view, but um, it's going to let you look at uh, a list of genomes either while you're browsing or uh, a group that you've created uh, yourself. And so <clears throat> this genome group is an important uh, term to remember because that's how you're going to be saving uh, your data. Uh, let's say if you have a group of viruses that you want to keep together. Uh, so keep that term in mind, genome group. And then uh, the feature view allows you to look at a single genomic feature. So for the most part, for viruses, these are going to be proteins, genes or proteins, um, and open reading frames. But we do have some additional information, such as um, uh, things like 5' prime and 3' prime UTRs. Um, and so same thing, the feature view lets you look at any information relating to that uh, gene, for example, uh, and the feature group view lets you look at a list of, um, let's say, proteins relating to uh, a certain set. And again, keep this uh, term in mind because the feature group is how you're going to save your groups of proteins so that you can analyze them uh, in the tools and services. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, we're interested in the pneumoviridae family. Uh, we know they've got two genera, uh, the metanumovirus and orthonumovirus, and um, uh, they have a few different species, including um, orthonumoviruses that infect non-humans, such as uh, cattle and mice. But uh, how would we go about looking uh, for that on the website? And so I'm going to be flipping back and forth between uh, the presentation and the site just to kind of help you um, navigate through it. So I'm going to go ahead and click on viruses. This takes me to the viral landing page. And as I said, um, the RSV belongs to the new Moverde family, so I can go ahead and click on that. This takes me to uh, the landing page on new Moverde. And sometimes it can be a little bit slow to load, especially if uh, <clears throat> we've got a lot of people jumping on the site. But uh, it'll give you a summary page uh, with all of the information on what's available for the new Moverde. Um, and if you go to the tab on taxonomy, this will uh, give you information on the new Moverde uh, family taxonomy. So again, we have the metanumovirus the orthonumovirus where we have RSV. Um, and when you click on that, it should open up shortly. Hopefully. Um, and then we can click on human orthonumovirus and see that we have RSV A, RSV B, uh, and the unclassified uh, viruses. <clears throat> so if we go ahead and click on uh, the genomes for this, this is going to uh, switch us to a tab uh, that just selects for uh, what we've, uh, for the box that we've selected here, so the orthonumoviruses. And if you click on that, that switches tabs to the genomes. And if you look at the breadcrumb trail over here, uh, you'll see that um, it's going to switch from uh, pneumoviruses 
to the human orthonumovirus, which includes all of the RSV, uh, A, and B genes. Um, and so that's what you would expect it to look like. And if you look at the information panel on the right, what, whichever entry you click on, it's going to give you information on what the taxonomic rank is, uh, which for me is always really useful when I'm uh, jumping into a new family that I'm not familiar with. Uh, sometimes it's hard to keep track of what's the genus, what's the subgenus, what's the species, what's below species level. Um, and so this is always really useful to me, the information panel here. It also gives you uh, the taxon ID, which can be yeah. very useful when using other tools so that you can specify um, what, let's say, what the taxon is for a specific annotation database that you need, uh, but we'll get more into that later. Um, <clears throat> so next up is uh, the genome group view, and as I mentioned, this is going to give you a list of all of the different uh, genomes that are available for RSV. Uh, in the case of a segmented virus like influenza, this will give you all of the individual segments as well. Um, but if you click on uh, the genome view, so for example, if you click on one of these entries and then go ahead and click on this genome uh, button in the action bar, the green action bar here, this will give you a little bit more information on that specific entry. Uh, telling you the tax ID, uh, some taxonomy information, whether the genome is complete or partial, whether there's any strain information and any other metadata that's associated with that entry. Uh, the feature view, group view is similar. Um, it'll, if you switch the tabs from uh, genomes to features uh, or proteins, it's going to give you all of the different uh, features that are there. We have uh, annotation both internally as well as the annotation that's imported from uh, GenBank. And that's important because uh, sometimes they might not match up. Uh, and one of the things that we aim to do with our database is to really kind of standardize the annotation so that if you're looking for uh, a specific open reading frame or a gene, you can find it more easily because uh, all of the names are uniform. Uh, so that's that's the goal. Uh, this hasn't been implemented for all of the virus families, but it is for RSV, so it's really easy to just select uh, the you know, G gene symbol or attachment glycoprotein, and all the names uh, are going to be the same. But if you click on an entry and then click on uh, the feature uh, button over here, this will again give you the individual um, information associated with that single entry. And so that is the feature view in the BVBRC. Um, so I thought I would take the time to kind of also just give you some information on uh, what the different uh, buttons and features are, because uh, obviously the website structure is quite different from what you might be used to in Viper. Um, so one of the things that is really useful on the site is kind of looking at these breadcrumbs. And these are going to be at the top of your page over here and will help you kind of tell where you are because sometimes uh, you might get lost. So in this case, uh, we're looking at human orthonumovirus, which includes RSVA and RSVB. Um, on the left of your window, you're going to have a download button and uh, whatever you select over here, uh, this download button will um, allow you to kind of download uh, the information uh, either as a text file uh, or as a comma separated values file or as an Excel file. So um, if you're just interested in getting a summary of the information that's there or the metadata, uh, that's quite useful. Um, if there are too many entries, so for example, there's 77,000 uh, genomes in this case or features, if you're interested just in one single thing or you have a specific keyword, you can use that to uh, get your list down a little bit. Um, and we also have a list of features, uh, of filters over here that you can use to further um, kind of bring down uh, your data set and help you narrow down exactly what you're looking for. Um, and all of the metadata is 
uh, associated. Sorry about that. Uh, all of the metadata here is um, coming from the GenBank entries. So the collection year, the isolation country. We also add the geographic group so that it's easier to filter uh, based on just North American sequences, European sequences, or things like that. Um, we also have uh, host names, host groups, and we spend a lot of time on curation of this data. Um, and you can add more or less information here by clicking on uh, this gear icon. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of other information that you might be interested in um, uh, filtering on based on that. So I would encourage you to kind of just take your time and play around with the site to get an idea of the different kinds of data that's there. Um, so then you each column obviously has a header. These are sortable just by clicking on them. Um, your individual uh, results are listed over here. Uh, the total number, you can scroll through the pages, uh, the bottom right, um, what's next? Um, this plus sign over here, it can be a little bit hidden, but it's actually really useful uh, because you can use it to customize this table view that you have. And there is a lot of information here, including um, information on the taxonomy. You can add or remove specific columns that you might be interested in. Uh, type information, and again, this is dependent on the viruses. So obviously, things like um, you know the H1 clade uh, are related to influenza, so don't apply over here. Uh, the genome quality cross reference. So if, let's say you want GenBank accession numbers as well as our internal uh, IDs. You can select those. Uh, genome statistics uh, annotation how many open reading frames or coding sequences uh, have been annotated for that specific uh, genome, uh, host information, and isolation information, which is always uh, useful to me. Uh, sometimes it's nice to look at the host common name as well as the uh, host scientific name that's provided uh, by NCBI or GenBank or people who deposit in GenBank. Um, all right, so next up we've got, um, let's see, next up, where was that? Nine, so over here you can select obviously the information that you're uh, interested in or the entries that you're interested in. If you click on the shift button, um, you can select a whole row altogether, which is quite useful and something I didn't know when I first started using these sites. Um, and then uh, in this green bar over here, so this is going to be something that you use a lot on this website. Uh, this is going to give you um, the ability to kind of manipulate the data in different ways. Um, <clears throat> you can download it, you can copy specific rows, uh, you can interact with the individual entries to look at a specific feature uh, or a genome. You can press the FASTA button to um, just look at the sequence and the group button to kind of uh, put specific entries into a working group or um, a genome group, a feature group, which are going to be how you save your data sets um, in your workspace on the BVBRC. And then finally, uh, the information panel, which I mentioned before, is going to be how you um, look at or view the information for a single entry uh, before you um, before you kind of download it or save it or anything else. Um, so that's the action bar. I went through that. Um, there's kind of general purpose buttons to download information, copy it group your entries into a working set. Um, you can click on, and each tab, each page will have a different series of these buttons. So uh, I encourage you to kind of just explore them. You can hover over them and it will give you um, a little uh, information on what, that, what each button does. Um, so you can kind of uh, learn as you go along. 
Um, and then we have also specific buttons for tools. For example, if you click on a few different entries and click on the MSA button, um, this will launch the multiple sequence alignment tool um, to align those entries. Uh, the workspace uh, action bar is also a little bit different. It helps you kind of manipulate uh, files and folders, uh, edit them, edit their type, move them, copy them, delete them, so on and so forth. Um, so next, I'm going to just quickly get into how you find information in the BVBRC, and there's three main ways to do it. One of them is through browsing, which we've already kind of um, gone through. Uh, if you're just know the general viral family or the metadata that you're interested in, you can do that. The other is through a global search, and uh, the third is through an advanced search. So real quick, we'll just go through those. Um, browsing would be kind of going to the main page, selecting your virus family, um, and then you can kind of, my favorite way to browse is through the taxonomy because uh, then I can uh, specify uh, everything that falls under that specific taxonomic group, um, which is my favorite way to do it. Uh, the other way you can do it is to go through our global search, and that's using this box up here. Um, and you can type in information for, let's say, uh, a specific um, virus. So let's say in this case, human respiratory syncytial virus. And uh, notice that you can select whether you want all data types or whether you want specific data type. Uh, for example, just genomes or just proteins or um, <clears throat> just uh, immune epitopes, for example. And so this will give you a summary page, giving you an idea of what you can find uh, for each of these different types of data. So 34 entries for uh, different taxonomic groups relating to RSV, um, about 22,000 genomes, um, 102,000 features, and so on and so forth. And you can just scroll down and look for these. So that was uh, how to find it through the global search. And Next, we'll go through um, how to find information using the advanced search button. Um, and you can go to the top of the page and you'll see uh, where it says searches. So let's say, for example, we're just interested in um, RSV uh, B genomes from 2019. I can go ahead and click on searches and genomes. And this will take me to the advanced search page where I can put in uh, any or all metadata that is relevant to me and what I'm looking for um, and search that way. You can enter a keyword, um, you can enter a pathogen group, um, whether you want bacterial or viral family. Um, you can enter the specific taxon name if you um, if you really want to get specific or put in a taxonomic ID. And uh, if you are patient, then you should get some suggestions uh, that match what you're looking for. So for me, that would be human respiratory syncytial virus B. Um, let's say human for the host group. Um, and let's say I only want things from or genomes from uh, Europe. And I want them, the genomes that were collected only in uh, 2019. Uh, if you want uh, only complete genomes, you can click on the complete button. Um, and then there's also a list of additional criteria that you can explore over here. And you can go ahead and click on search. Again, um, the breadcrumbs up here will give you an idea of what it is that you've used for your search criteria, and you'll see your list of 78 results here. So let's say you'd like to save these. You can go ahead and click on all of them, and then you're going to go to group. Now what this does um, is um, save these results for you in what's called a genome group. 
And this is how you're going to save um, your nucleic acids um, data sets in the BBBRC. So um, in this case, we don't already have an existing group. So you're going to click on new group. Um, and then you specify the folder that you want. The BVBRC comes with a default folder for genome groups. So you can either make a new folder by clicking on this icon um, and just adding a new folder, or you can just uh, save it to the default genome group folder where all of your um, uh, nucleic acid data sets will be saved by default. RSVB. 2019, Europe. And so then you'll get a little pop up in the bottom left telling you your group has successfully been created. Um, <clears throat> so there are different types of data sets that you can find in the BVBRC. For RSV specifically, there's uh, five main ones. Um, and that includes the genomic information, which is obviously the uh, nucleic acids uh, entries, of the genomes or genome fragments. You've got the features and proteins, which are quite similar. Um, obviously, the proteins tab is going to be exclusively just for the protein information, and the features will include uh, information such as um, let's say, uh, let's see what comes up here. But sometimes you have uh, features in addition to the open reading frames, such as LTRs, um, UTRs, um, tr specific transcription regulatory features, um, and those should appear any second now <laughs> over here. Um, <clears throat> and then we also have protein structures. So uh, let's say if the structure of a specific uh, RSV protein has been determined either through um, X-ray crystallography or other methods. You're going to be able to find them there. The domains and motifs are going to uh, tell you a little bit about structural motifs, uh, whether it's um, a helix, a base sheet, um, and other things as well. Uh, there's a lot to explore, and they're um, imported from a few different uh, websites, so it's I would encourage you to explore those. Um, and then for the immunologists or people interested in immunology, uh, we also have a tab for the immune epitopes. And you can find those um, by navigating to a specific um, C. Once you are in the taxon view, let's just wait for this to load. So your protein structures will be over here, um, and these will be a list of different proteins um, that have had their structure experimentally determined either through electron microscopy, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, resonance or X-ray crystallography. Um, there's a number of different filters and metadata that you can use to um, search for the specific information that you're looking for. Um, again, the domains and motifs you can find just by flipping to the next tab. Um, again, the different motifs are um, from different sources. Uh, they can You can search for specific proteins uh, by, let's say, for example, uh, you're only interested in motifs relating to the G protein. You can click on this advanced search button, tell it you're only interested in the gene equals to G, click on search, and that will help uh, filter the results to uh, things that are most relevant to you. Similarly, for the immune epitopes tab, we have uh, immune epitopes based on uh, B cell epitopes, uh, T cell epitopes, and uh, MHC. Uh, 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 multi-histocompatibility complex epitopes as well. Uh, you can filter by the specific host name, the protein name, whether you're interested in uh, continuous or discontinuous peptides, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, the protein structure page will give you a list of the protein structures. 
Um, and as I said, each page is going to have its different uh, icons that you can use in the green action bar. If you click on uh, an entry for a specific protein structure and click on the structure button, it'll open up a new page for you uh, so that you can visualize and interact with the structure uh, using Molstar Viewer, uh, the domains and motifs. Uh, again, just to summarize that point and the immune epitopes. So I'm going to take a two minute break and just make sure that there are uh, no questions um, and give the uh, opportunity for people question. to ask questions. Sure. Here's a question. Someone asks if these are from only GenBank or does it include Jesaid? Uh, yes. So unfortunately, uh, as many of you know, we are not allowed to reproduce Jesaid's data or metadata. Uh, however, what you can do is uh, download data from GISAID and upload it to uh, <clears throat> the BVBRC. And that's why we've got uh, the workspaces. So if you click on your workspace, you can click on uploads, you can uh, drag and drop uh, multiple different types of files here, protein, uh, DNA, uh, pretty much anything under the sun that you can think of in terms of bioinformatic information and upload it to our site uh, so that you can analyze it together with the public data that's available. Also, there are many questions about downloading more than 10,000 rows of data, and are we going to demo that? I've been steering people towards the command line interface, but perhaps you would like right. to address that. Sure. So um, unfortunately, that is a problem for um, downloading through the graphical user interface. But if you go to our documentation uh, site, which you'll find underneath the, the help icon, uh, we do have a tutorial and information on the command line interface. Um, and this is a pretty good uh, resource, I think, to teach people how to install uh, the CLI, how to use it. Um, there's a lot of, um, it's actually a very powerful tool once you um, figure out exactly what uh, different commands are. You can search by a specific taxon, uh, different kinds of uh, inputs and outputs, information that you want. But I do think it would be a great idea, Rebecca, to have um, a specific uh, webinar just based on the command line interface. Let me point out that we do have some of those from the workshops that right. are line, but this is, uh, you're right, and I have been trying to get our command line expert to um, agree to that, but he's a tricky character and, it, and wiggles out of things <laughs> on occasion. Um, he's busy doing real But work. you can also <laughs> ask us questions through the help thing that goes directly to him, and he'll give you the commands that you need to use. Carlos asks, can you filter to avoid redundant sequences? Um, that is not something I think that we've transferred over from Viper and IRD yet, but it's something that's on our wish list um, and our, on our to-do list, I think. Jacob McPherson asks, would love to hear if there's integration with NCBI datasets or NCBI entrees. Um, should I say entree? <laughs> not that I know of. Um, we do have a good relationship with uh, NCBI, but uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of information you're looking for. Okay. And I think some people are still hitting the 10,000 rows, and I'm still, whether it's bacterial, whether it's viral, the command line interface, I think is the best way to go about that. But also you can email us through the help documentation and then we can 
address your particular problem. And we have a bunch of very hung uh, developers that love a challenge. So if you have something you're having trouble getting at, they would um, relish the distraction of trying to craft you a command that will suit your needs. Yeah, so, um, um, you know, we we do realize it's a big change for users coming from Viper and IRD, and there's going to be some hiccups. Um, you know, we don't expect everything to work perfectly for you, but we are very responsive. So if you go to the About button and click on Contact Us and say, you know, hey, uh, I can't stand the new site. I can't figure out how to do anything. Help me <laughs> figure it out. We will help you. Um, we just ask you to be patient and uh, give us the chance to help you get the data and information that you need. Uh, just give us a subject line. Um, if you have a job that fails, if you could give us any, the more information you give us, the more we can help you, whether it's screen caps, the input files, um, just you know what tool or URL you're using. Um, that would be fantastic. Along those lines, we got a question from Jacob McPherson. Jacob, could you please put your question about the uh, command line interface documentation, making it available for an, uh, the Anaconda channel? If you put that in the help question, that will go directly to the developer who controls that, and he will start thinking about it, or he will be able to answer that better because he's the backbone of the whole system. So that would be great if you would do that. And I'll also comment on that in the in the oh he got it okay okay wow lots of download questions yeah it's uh there's a lot of information <laughs> um that people typically get from viper um and the metadata and the, the data through the api okay um well if there are no other questions I'm going to uh, try to run through the different types of tools and services that you can use for RSV. Uh, now that this is not everything the website has to offer, um, but it's just to give you a high level overview. And then um, if somebody wants me to walk through a specific tool, um, I'd be happy to do that towards the end of uh, the webinar. So these are the kind of different tools and services that you can use for RSV. Um, I've kind of divided them by what I think are uh, relevant topics. So for sequencing and annotation, um, if you have a specific, um, if you're sequencing RSV genomes yourself, we have FastQ utilities that you can use to um, look at the quality of your <clears throat> sequencing run. Uh, to we can also you can also use it to align. Um, the specific reads to RSV, for example. Uh, we don't have reference-based assembly, but we do have de novo assembly where you can take um, those reads that align to RSV uh, and assemble them through our assembly service. Uh, but reference-based assembly is also on our wish list for viruses. Once you have your genome, we have annotation tools uh, that you can use to annotate your genome, uh, whether it's RSV A or B. And uh, this will give you uh, your open reading frames and a file that you can use for submission to GenBank. Uh, and again, we use our annotation throughout the entire site to um, make all of the entries uniform so that it's much easier to find data sets that are uh, complete, standardized, um, and can be analyzed without having to do a ton of uh, curation and clean up yourself. Um, for metagenomic samples, we've got our taxonomic classifier, uh, as well as metagenomic binning, where you can just uh, a bin viral gene, viral reads um, into specific bins. So let's say uh, you have a swab from a person with a respiratory infection, and it'll bin it into, um, let's say they have a co-infection of influenza and RSV, you'll have a bin for RSV, a bin for um, influenza reads, and then you can go on to assemble those uh, contexts from those specific bins. For comparative genomics, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are, if you're coming from IRD, you're already familiar with what we have to offer there. 
Uh, the tools are pretty similar, the multiple sequence aligner uh, and SNP analysis, which have been combined into one tool. Uh, gene tree, which is our phylogenetic tree builder, but obviously you can use it to um, uh, make phylogenetic trees for whole genomes. We really need to rename this. Um, and the MetaCAT tool, which allows you to compare different data sets based on uh, the metadata associated with them. Uh, and we also have a couple of others, including um, pretty standard tools like uh, BLAST, Primer Design. Um, and one thing that we are working on now is subspecies classification for RSV, um, although we offer it for several other viruses. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to touch on is um, things that have changed in terms of uh, terminology for your know, workspace and workbench. Um, so it's important to um, for you guys to know that your IRD and Viper credentials will work for the BVBRC. You don't have to change anything, uh, but you obviously do need to log in to use uh, our workbench. The only thing that's changed is it's called a work uh, bench instead of a, um, a workspace instead of a workbench now. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can upload files, download them, uh, share them with different users, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then it does come with a few default folders. And again, I really want to drive home these two terms, genome groups, where you can save your nucleic acid uh, data sets, and feature groups where uh, you'll be saving your protein data sets. And uh, those are really important uh, terms so that you can um, use them for uh, uploading specific da data sets to the different tools on uh, the BVBRC. You can get to the tools by clicking on the tools and services button up here. Uh, and these are somewhat divided by the different types of tools. Um, although, again, I think we do need to rearrange some of these. The multiple sequence alignment and gene tree tools are not just for proteins. You can use them for the viral genomes as well, our metagenomic tools, um, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> getting into uh, what the different tools look like, I'm just going to uh, run you through what the expected output would be for each tool. Um, and then if somebody wants a demo for a specific one, we could do that. Uh, so this is just um, to give you an idea of what the FastQC tool does. I've uploaded an, um, a file from SRA over here that had RSV in it, and it'll give you a nice FastQC report telling you um, what the basic QC statistics are for your um, for your specific uh, sequencing run, um, and you can also map it uh, uh, map the reads to RSV specifically, and this will also give you um, statistics of that mapping output. You can assemble uh, using our de novo assembler. Uh, this will give you a bandage plot showing you kind of what to expect and we'll tell you how much, <clears throat> and we'll give you some statistics on um, what the assembly job was like. You have a nice uh, HTML report um, that I can kind of scroll through and show you what that looks like. Um, if you do want to uh, assemble RSV, um, our annotation tool allows for annotation of RSV A and B. Um, but you do have to be careful um, which annotation recipe that you're selecting. Make sure you specify viruses, not bacteria. Um, and <clears throat> the, the taxonomy uh, name or ID. And again, if you're not sure, then I encourage you to just click on uh, the taxonomy tab um, and figure out what specific uh, taxon ID uh, you'd like to annotate. If you're not sure, then um, at least try uh, the genus, if not species level. And then you input your data and click on annotate. Um, this is an example of um, an RSV or uh, annotation of RSV context that I assembled from 
uh, an SRA run, and I've got my proteins over here for each one of the contigs that I uploaded. Um, and there's multiple different uh, files that you can download, including FASTA files, the GenBank files, um, or the GenBank ready submission ready files. Um, <clears throat> so then moving on to our metagenomic tools, uh, I really love this tool because it's such a great way to <clears throat> give you an idea of what's in your uh, what's in your metagenomic sample. So this one was uh, a sample that included RSV, <clears throat> and it'll give you a taxonomic report. Um, this is using the Kraken tool to give you an idea of uh, how many reads you have for each specific taxonomic level. Um, so this one was mostly human, for example, uh, but it did have quite a lot of, uh, about 5% of the reads were uh, RSV. Um, and it'll give you the specific number of uh, reads and the specific tax ID for uh, each taxonomic level that you're interested in. Uh, this is our taxonomic, this is our metagenomic binning tools output. Um, and this is the viral binning report. So again, this was a metagenomic sample that I submitted to um, the tool and it created several different uh, viral bins. And in the case of um, RSVB, uh, this was this can be found in bin 12. And what this is, is basically a collection of uh, the different uh, reads that um, uh, are or contexts that have been um, put together for that uh, for each taxonomic group. So in this sample, there were some uh, mainly reads for RSV but maybe uh, a few uh, reads of low coverage for maybe influenza or in other respiratory viruses. Um, this is the output from our multiple sequence aligner, and you can input, again, either um, viral genomes or viral proteins. In this example, I'm looking at uh, a group of RSV proteins from uh, the G protein, and it's going to tell you for each specific position in the alignment um, what uh, the difference is um, for each particular position, how many alanines, isoleucines, prolines there are, for example, at position um, 322. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that you can align it to a reference and you can choose your own reference. So in this case, I just used the NCBI RefSeqs to align it and it'll give you the position in the reference and the position in your alignment. And uh, you can see what's there for each one. You can visualize it in our multiple sequence alignment viewer. Um, and I love this because it gives you an idea of where the most variable uh, sites are in your alignment. You can then use um, those multiple sequence alignments or uh, unaligned sequences to build phylogenetic trees. Um, and we have um, our Archaeopteryx tree viewer, which you can use to um, look at the metadata that's in the website. And you can colorize your tree or branches or names based on um, the metadata associated with those entries because it's already integrated into the database. And for example, in this tree, I have a collection of uh, RSV A uh, G proteins from 2019, and I'm comparing them to um, uh, RSV G proteins from the last six months in 2022. So obviously there are not many public genomes for RSV um, from the past year. So what I did was I downloaded them from GISAID. I um, put them together with data uh, from public genomes in the BVBRC. And you can see that uh, they're interspersed uh, between each other on the tree. So that's one of the things that people have been asking a lot this year. Why is there so much more RSV? Is it is the virus so different from previous years? But if you look at the tree, that doesn't appear to be the case. 
but hopefully this does address um, your questions about data from GISAID. So while we can't provide it ourselves, you are uh, more than welcome to upload it uh, yourself and analyze it. Uh, unfortunately, we can't um, integrate the metadata into uh, the website yet, but uh, we are working on uh, making it making it um, available to users so that they can upload not just the FASTA sequences, but also the metadata associated with them. Um, <clears throat> next up, we have our MetaCats tool. And this is uh, a metadata-driven comparative analysis tool. And what it does is basically just compare um, through making multiple sequence alignments, a specific position from one group versus another. So in this case, I'm again comparing the G proteins from sequences from 2019 versus those from 2022. Um, and the most these are the most statistically significant uh, positions. So let's say, for example, in my multiple sequence alignment from 2019 at position number 142, I have uh, 63 leucines and 81 serines, but um, in the genomes from 2022, the majority of them have leucine in that position. So these are these can kind of give you a hint into, um, let's say, why one group of viruses might be more pathogenic than another, um, what amino acids at what position tend to be more common in a specific geographic region, um, versus another and it's it's a really nice way of just giving you hints at what are the relevant uh, amino acids to look at uh, for experimental studies um, <clears throat> so this is uh, just what the blast tool uh, output looks like this is an example of a contig that i assembled from my uh, sra run and blasted um, and these are the most similar sequences that come up in the database. And what's nice about this is that you can, um, th there's multiple different options for uh, the BLAST tool, including, um, including, where is it? So once you're here, you can select the different types of BLAST, whether you want nucleotide to nucleotide, protein, protein, uh, protein to nucleotides. Um, <clears throat> there's different ways to input your um, uh, your your input files, and we also have specific uh, databases that you can blast against, uh, including specific taxonomic groups. If you want to look at uh, blast against your own customized um, genome group or feature group. Uh, that you've saved in the workbench, uh, blasting against a specific taxon, or just blast, uh, blasting against uh, reference and representative genomes. All right, I think we just have a couple more slides before I open it up for demos and questions. Uh, this is the output for our primer design tool. So let's say um, you've uh, found a specific region that is conserved in um, your multiple sequence alignment and want to design primers that amplify uh, that specific area. Uh, you can use our primer design tool to get some uh, candidates for PCR or RT-PCR um, and do that. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is our subspecies classification tool. Um, so while RSV is divided into RSV A and B, um, there's also a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of different genotypes that have been discussed, including uh, the more recent ones like uh, I think it's ON1. Um, but we have subspecies classification available for different viruses right now, including many members of the Flavi Verde family. Um, for influenza, our clade classification system, for rotavirus A, uh, norovirus, which is new, and for um, RSV A and RSV B, we are working on that and hope to have that uh, done soon. So if you are 
and RSV experts and know a lot about genotyping, do get in touch with me. I would love to hear your ideas and uh, opinions for that because uh, the field is quite messy and defining genotypes is not trivial. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, in two weeks time, uh, we'll also have another webinar to help orient people to the site, uh, but specifically focused on influenza data in the BVBRC for those of you uh, coming from IRD and who are interested in influenza uh, as well. And with that, I will open it up to questions and we can demo any tools that uh, anyone is interested in. Okay, I, there's a question that I promised you would answer from uh, Miga Agarwal. She, I, she wanted to know if you could download the feature table file, which you can, but she yes. talked about submitting it to GenBank. And I know that there are some functions where you guys um, provide GenBank submissions. So I thought you would be best to address that. Right. So, um... For the only thing that we submit to GenBank right now is influenza. Uh, but if you look at uh, the output files from our annotation tool, which is what I've got open over here, uh, you'll see that we do have, um, let's see, the GFF files over here, which are what you would normally submit uh, to GenBank. So you can easily download those and then go through the Rankit system to uh, submit those to GenBank so that you can Another. give them an annotated genome. Another question from the same participant. Um, she's asking about genome gene search and what is the search criteria for time? Is it based on collection date or submission date? Um, I think so those two I, are separate, right? So let's but. see if we go to the searches. Um, normally, you've got collection year over here um, because that is what's submitted to GenBank. But if you are looking in the in the tables, um, they usually have the submission dates in the metadata as well. And I think you can use. Um, let's see. I think you can also use the additional data to find that. Let's see, that should be here somewhere. I think it's down at the Yeah, middle. so like date yeah, inserted or date bottom. modified. Yeah. There you go. OK, um, lots of questions. What uh, Alexi? Oroyo says, what are the features of Epitope's tools at BVBRC that stand out from IEBB? Um, so I have to say I'm not super familiar with uh, the IEDB site. Either. Um, <laughs> That's why I asked you. <laughs> but um, if you are looking for Epitope's, I think, um, I would say that one of the reasons to use the BBBRC is just that it's an easier way to search for something specifically relating to that virus that you're interested in. Um, and a big advantage is also the host name um, curation and the standardization of uh, kind of naming so that you don't have to kind of dig through the data and say, OK, I want homo sapiens, I want human, I want man, woman, what's etc. Um, it's just tidier in some ways. OK. Uh, Mohammed, I asks, do you have human papilloma, papilloma virus data in your resource or is this just for respiratory? We do actually. That is something um, that we added recently um, as a change from Viper. We've added a few new families, and many of those are double stranded um, uh, DNA viruses. We've got um, 
Oh, I thought we added the papillomavirus family. I guess we don't have that one. We did add adenoviridae. We did add uh, asparviridae, which is um, African swine fever virus. We've got polio, poliomaviridae. Those are new as well. Um, and the hepatomaviridae and parvoviridae. But I think, I think yes, now I remember the reason we didn't add papillomavirus is because I think there's a specific database that already exists just for papillomavirus. Um, but yeah, we have I, multiple viral families. Um, Mohammed, if you want a link to that, please go or please go to the help thing and, and then we will respond to share the link with you. Uh, Wang asks, would you please share the reference genome sequences used for the phylogenetic tree construction that you showed? Uh, hmm. So I believe that um, that RSV A and B have uh, one uh, reference sequence each, and I can look those up for you. But also just demoing this should show that you could just go into genomes and click the filters and see reference right yeah. away. So one of the things that we have here is um, underneath the, the filters, if you click on that button, is you can choose whether or not you want complete genomes only <clears throat> and whether or not you want to look at uh, reference genomes. So these are typically um, the NCBI reference genomes for the different viruses. So we've got human orthoneumovirus B here. Um, and I think there should be A somewhere as well. And you can uh, get rid of your selection by clicking on these X's over here. Um, this region will also kind of show you what you do and don't have clicked. Um, or selected for. Uh, and one thing I did forget to say is that, um, let's say you only want complete genomes. Um, one thing that you can do that's important is to click on this apply button. So if you only want complete genomes, let's say that were isolated from um, cattle or yeah, you can click on the apply button and what this is going to do is um, transfer those uh, metadata criteria to these other tabs so that when you click on uh, features, um, that's that's what you uh, are going to get. OK, uh, next question. The maximum size for a FASTQ file, there is no limit that what you can upload to the workspace so uh and if the one problem that we have if you don't mind my taking this is if you have a okay, really so. big fast q file sometimes we have set times for the assembly service and if it's really big it will run out of time and the job will fail then you need to report that assembly job to us could you show how to go into a jobs and report an issue when they have one sure. And then we look at it and they say, oh, it ran out of time. I, we all look at it and the developer will reset it with more time. But yes, the files are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, right now there are no limits. Right, so that's that's one another thing that I um, haven't discussed yet. Um, if you look at the bottom right corner of your screen, uh, you've got two boxes. One of them is to show you the status of your uploads um, for any files that you've uploaded. And this is something to pay attention to if you're uploading a particularly large file and want to run it um, in a tool. Just make sure the upload is complete before you uh, try to run the job. Otherwise, it's going to fail. Uh, but if you double click on um, or if you hover over this, it's going to show you how many jobs you've got queued how many jobs are running, how many jobs are completed. Double clicking on this will open up uh, a list of your jobs as well uh, going to the workspaces tool and clicking on my jobs. 
and that'll give you a list of your recently submitted jobs, how many completed, how many are running, how many failed. Uh, if you do have a failed job, what you can do is click on this and uh, click on report an issue with this job. Um, and that will open up uh, this window that uh, you can add any additional notes to, but really helps the developers figure out what the problem is because it's giving the job ID and uh, the input uh, and output for those jobs. And you click submit uh, to tell us something went wrong. I wasn't expecting a problem with this. Uh, can you please help me out? And we usually try to respond to you within uh, 24 to 48 hours. OK, um, Mohammed asks, can you please demo the primer design tool? Sure. Um, so let's see. So this is the primer design tool. Um, you have a couple of different uh, input options. Either you can just paste in your sequence. Uh, you can give it a name over here uh, or you can uh, use something from the workspace. Uh, either a FASTA file that you've uploaded or uh, that you've saved in uh, a different um, from a different job. Um, <clears throat> you can choose uh, whether or not to uh, pick an internal oligo if you're doing real time PCR. If you're just looking to do Sanger um, uh, sequencing or you know just a PCR out of fragment. Uh, for, for other purposes, you don't need to bother picking an internal oligo. Um, and then we have kind of some uh, kind of uh, parameters that are default over here. You can change them, uh, including the primer size, um, the product size that you expect. Um, you can choose whether there's specific regions or not that you um, want to include or exclude. Uh, let me see if I can grab a sequence to, um, to copy and paste. Uh, let's try one of these. All right, so let's say I pick my sequence over here paste it into there, um, and let's say I want a specific target region um, that I really want the primer to be over here, for example. Um, then you can click on this type of bracket button over here to specify that that's where you want the primer, um, and then you can use these different buttons to choose whether um, Let's say uh, these arrows, for example, are to exclude specific regions. Uh, these are to indicate a specific target region where you want the primer at. Um, you can use uh, these braces to specify included regions. Um, and then you can uh, specify whether or not there are specific positions that you want um, to, to designate primer overlaps. Uh, if you have a specific melting temperature that you want for your primers, you can input that here. A specific GC content, same thing. Um, and then if you are a primer expert and want to specify uh, the concentration, uh, you can also do that here. Then you specify your output folder. Um, in this case, let's say just experiments and give it a name. And then uh, the submit button should become available to, um, to click on. When you go ahead and click on submit, you can find your jobs um, over there. Click on primer design, um, and this will give you a report. There's a few different files over here. Uh, the FASTA file for your primers, uh, the input output, and the HTML table. If you look at this eye icon in the top right section of your uh, screen this will usually give you the main output and that's what your table would look like let me point okay. out that i have failed with this so many times because I, I do everything but i forget to adjust the size that i expect 
And like yeah. the last one, it was 505 and it kept failing and I was so frustrated. So you have mm -hmm. to pay attention to what the defaults are. Yeah, and you can take them out if you know if you if you don't want them. But uh, sometimes it's it's a little bit of trial and error. Yeah, but if you do have problems. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can see my list of failed jobs here, so. <laughs> um, uh, I can't remember who asked uh, about a hybrid assembly. Have you done those? If you could go to it, I can show you if you go directly to assembly right now, the interface there. Sure. OK, and so uh, Ahmed, I believe you could submit paired reads and you could submit single reads at the same time. To do this, though, you will need to specify under the recipe, you would need to do canoe or unicycler to do the hybrid assembly. Canoe is for long reads, and what it'll do is it'll come in and polish with your short reads after you're done, whereas Unicycler does a more standard one where it will um, use them, I guess, all at the same time. And also, if you click off that for a second, Anna, the box, uh, and click on Advanced at the bottom of that, yeah. You can ask it, yeah, you can, ask it, right now the default is to trim, but you can ask it to do Racon or Pylon iterations, which is asking it to come in and rerun it and polish it. What Racon, I believe, is for the long reads and Pylon is for the short reads, and you can ask for certain rounds to do this. The more you ask for, the longer it's going to take. We set it with two, which I think is plenty, but um, yes, you can do it. Here's another question. Oh, and just before you move on, I just wanted to yeah. say, if you also have multiple SRA runs, um, you can uh, input those, click on the arrow and assemble uh, from multiple, uh, let's say if you have multiple runs for a single sample and combine those. Uh, Mina would like you to demonstrate. Let me look at what she asked for because a lot of people asked for that and then I forgot what it was she wanted. Oh, demo download of genome data through the interface. Uh, okay, so let's see. We've got, let's go to our Numo Veridate family. Go to, let's say, for this to load. Oh, we're a little slow this morning. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Well, while we're waiting for that to load, Hamid asks, is there an instructor for users to do standard data entry when uploading? Um. Scratching I'm my head on that one too. Not sure what that means. Um, is there like a, a video tutorial or a tutorial for how to upload data? I there can. Should, I can. There should be. I think we did one, but we uh, we can check. It may not be this. broken out separately like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, I can. I can walk through it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, like, so let me. Actually, I'm not sure what's meant there either. Okay, now we're ready for this one. Go okay, so um, let's say, for example, I want to download, um, I don't know, let's pick some old RSV uh, genomes from 1994. I'm going to select all of those, and then I can go to this action bar over here to click on download. So this is going to give me the option to download um, this as a text file, um, or to download the table as um, a comma separated value file that can be opened in uh, a program program like Excel, um, or you can just download uh, the FASTA sequences. So I'm going to click on the FASTA sequences and that's it. It's done. Um, if you want the proteins, it's a pretty similar um, method. You can click on either the features 
which includes uh, the non-protein features that you might find in a genome as well, uh, or just the proteins. And um, if you want the ones, again, just from 1994, you do have to click on apply. And then you switch tabs. And so that'll show you over here that the coll collection year is 1994. Um, it can be a little slow sometimes. I know we've been doing some maintenance on the website, but then again, you can just select all of your genomes or select just the ones you're interested in. Um, you can use the advanced search to specify that you just want proteins from uh, a specific gene. Uh, are we gene? There we go. Such as G and then um, select all of those and then click on the download button. Um, now, the nice thing about this is it'll allow you to uh, download either the amino acids or the nucleic acid sequence for, let's say, just the G protein of RSV, uh, in addition to downloading the table as a text file or a CSV file. Um. Connie asks, can subspecies classification be done on partial on a partial gene genome, G gene, for example, for full or is full genome required? So it it really depends on what you're trying to classify. Um, <clears throat> so here, I'll I'll go to the tool. Uh, so this is our subspecies classification tool. If you click on this drop down menu for species. Um, it's going to give you an idea of what's available. Something like a flavivirus like dengue, is that tree is based on uh, the whole genome for that particular flavivirus. Uh, something like influenza, for example, is just based on uh, the hemagglutinin segment of influenza. So you don't need all eight or uh, all eight segments of the influenza A virus. Um, something like a rotavirus, um, again, a segmented virus. I think um, any one of those segments uh, can be input. Uh, something like norovirus, um, you can input shorter sequences because uh, these two options uh, for trees or for placement are based either on the ORF1 or ORF2 open reading frame. Uh, so I think that's something that uh, we need to include in the documentation, and I have that uh, on my list. But um, if you're using uh, something like dengue, it's really important probably to have as much of the virus as you can. If it's something like uh, norovirus, then that gene is enough. Ani is asking specifically, though, she ju they, they just qualified for RSV. Um, okay, so for... Species. So for RSV, it has not been implemented yet. Um, I'm working on it, um, but there's a lot of debate in the field uh, on what to use for RSV uh, subspecies classification or genotyping. Some people use the entire G protein, some people use just the ectodomain, and some people use like the 300 base pair fragment of the uh, variable region in the G protein. So we're researching uh, the best way to do that at the moment and hope to have that implemented soon. We're consulting with people who work in RSV, um, but uh, if people have opinions or feedback, um, I would love to hear from them. Uh, and you can just drop me a note in the contact us uh, button because I don't think there's agreement in the field on genotyping methods. Um, several, Pamela included, have asked for us to demo some of these things through command line. This okay. is not my specialty. <laughs> I don't think it's Anna's either, but there have been so many requests that I will grab hold of the develop command line developer and tell him he is going to have to do a webinar on command line with, so you should send us your questions of well, what you would like to see through command line, and then we will 
we will um, uh, get him to to do it. Yeah, Pamela, it would be actually really useful to have um, detailed use cases. So let's say I want to download, um, you know, this many um, genomes with this metadata for this yeah. taxonomic group, and I want the output file to be, you know, FASTA nucleotide, or I want the metadata and uh, FASTA amino acids or something like that. The more detailed, the better. There's been several thumbs up just at the mention of that, Ron. So we really have to get in touch with the developer that we of whom we speak to let him know that we have a special Christmas gift for him is that he gets to do a CLI webinar. Pamela I mean, asks. Uh, just I did post in the in the chat a link to the video tutorials, and there is uh, at the bottom of that list there are three: one for the installation, one and for the overview and one for doing job submission using the CLI, but it's it's kind of general purpose rather than sort of detailed use cases. And it's at a <laughs> workshop that we had in person and it was it's a little bit complicated. So if we could get a directed one, I think it would be good. Pamela asks if we can annotate prophages using these tools. Prophages. Well, no, we do we you. do bacteriophages. So used to on um, when BV BRC was separated, Patrick virus when you, you were in Patrick, viruses meant bacteriophages. But now it, viruses uh, bacteriophages belong back in the um, viral group where they live. Uh, if they're alive because they're viruses and we don't want to debate that. But yes, you can do it and I encourage you to do it. And I know that Rami Aziz, oh no, that was a different, I just got the guy who's the bacteriophage expert, he just gave a lecture on, on using our system to do that. So yes, you can do that. Also, somebody asked, they can't find the papilloma, human papilloma virus database. And okay. if you can show that, um, Lauren, it's. Can you just take a note of that email and I will um, email them when this is done? I, I can't see the email. So who if was If you just take a one? note of the name, I can find it. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, OK, I will. And I think the chat should be saved, so I will okay. um, try to get back to them. All right, we'll get but back to you, Mohammed, on that. To note that um, for viruses, we don't annotate all families of viruses. Uh, we're working on it to further expand it. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about our annotation tool, you can find it at this GitHub site. Um, and the VigorDB folder will show you the reference databases that we have for the different uh, types of viruses. Um, right now we have a lot of bunya viruses, uh, influenza, some uh, coronavirus databases, uh, monkeypox, obviously, um, RSV, uh, rotavirus, uh, SARS-CoV, and many different uh, flaviviruses as well. But if you have a specific uh, request, then uh, let us know as well. And Pamela, Pamela for um, bacteriophages, if you could go back to the website or the home page and just click on bacteria or the viruses actually, and oh. click on bacteriophages. Nope, it's, oh, yeah, and viruses. <clears throat> All of these have been annotated with our pipeline. So we have this many bacteriophages in there. I give workshops or I have for the past, I think, three of them, the Evergreen workshops in um, outside of Seattle, where, what is it, Olympia? I can't remember exactly where it is. That's the bacteriophage stuff, and we do demos of how to do um, this annotation and analysis. When you've done these things with the bacteriophages in the website, because they are assigned protein families that we get, um, that we use for the bacteria, well, they're not for bacteria, but the specific protein families, it opens up a number of our tools, including genome alignment, 
uh, phylogenetic tree, which is the whole genome stuff, mm -hmm. and things like comparative systems. So all of that is open to you if for your um, bacteriophage analysis. The problem is they're small. So sometimes like when you're building a phylogenetic tree, it they may not share proteins. And on the big phylogenetic trees that it says is for bacteria only, you'd have to be sure they shared enough genes to create a tree. So I hope that helps. Oh, Lauren, Olympia, Washington, thank you. Also, I, I, Mohammed. Um, so, so Rebecca, before Samuel you move on, responded. that's just something I, I wanted to point out. This phylogenetic tree is for bacteria, whereas um, this tree, the gene tree, is what we use for viruses. But Sorry, the bacteria phages, because they've been annotated yes. with the old pipeline and they get the special protein families, the cross genus protein families, those are the only ones right now that you can use, uh, viruses that you can use the that phylogenetic tree. Right. Um, Mohammed Samuel uh, helpfully answered your question about papillomavirus information. It's you guys should be able to see it. It's from that whatever we've got. Anna, we've got you. Um, Mohammed, we've got your email, and we will um, make sure you you have access to the human papillomavirus database. Right, so there are a couple of viruses um, that we that have their own specialized databases, something like HIV. Uh, so that's why we don't provide that in Viper, even though it's obviously a major uh, pathogen of human importance. Well, also originally the BRCs were not allowed for some reason. They didn't want them to include sexually transmitted organisms. Why? I don't know. But uh, and not all human papillomaviruses are sexually transmitted. So anyhow, no, the majority aren't. Yeah. Um, and one thing I did want to point out is that if you scroll down to the bottom of our page, we have um, our social media icons over here. Um, not saying you have to follow us on them, but uh, if you go to the YouTube icon, um, there's a lot of helpful information. Uh, over there, including tutorials, past uh, webinars and workshops. Um, and I think uh, this video will obviously be up there soon. Um, there's specific, uh, there's videos for specific tools uh, that are uh, use, you might find useful, uh, especially if they're new to you, um, if you're coming from one resource versus the other. Um, if you want details on, let's say, the FASTQ utilities or taxonomic classification, um, you know, they're going to be a lot more detailed than this webinar, of course. Um, but yeah, dig through yeah. these. They're useful. Um, a lot of people are interested in the human papillomaviruses. Maybe we should consider <laughs> bringing them in. <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, that's not up to us. <laughs> yeah, that's not up to us. Uh, there was one but, other yeah. thing, but I can't find it right now. Oh, will you send out an email? Will we send out an email to all participants when the videos become available on the YouTube channel? Of course, we always do. OK. And, um, you know, if there's anything you missed or just want another refresher, um, I will be demoing the site again in two weeks, but using uh, influenza as our case study. Same time, just in two weeks on the 13th of December. Um, and if you, you know, again, have any specific requests or, you know, you find something frustrating or you want, you are used to something in IRD and Viper and you can't find them here, uh, really do get in touch with us. Um, we want to help you. We realize it's a big transition. Um, and we will try and be responsive, whether it means emailing you back or even just setting up uh, a Zoom call or an online video call with you to kind of help walk you through something. The questions have died down. OK. So in that case, 
since we're almost at 10. Um, I guess I will just thank you guys all for coming and um, with your patience with the transition and um, I will have this recording up online. Follow us on our social media if you want to uh, hear more about opportunities like this to learn about the website. We also offer free workshops um, in person and online. And um, let us know if there's anything else that you that we can help support you with.